Welcome back, golf fans, to another Roto Pros Fantasy Golf Preview. With me, as always, is the other member of our PGA team over at Roto Pros, Dane Chenault. How's it going tonight? It's going good. Um, we were just talking a massive drop in strength of field, and it's sandwiched between the players and a WGC. So that's the reason for it. But hey, always ready to jump in. Oh, yeah, man. It's uh, we don't have any players inside the top 10, I don't believe. And like there's seven inside the top 50. It is, you know, it kind of falls off. So I guess the first thing we always talk about in field strength uh, right off the bat in, in terms of these weeks where we don't have really strong fields is we're going to see prices like 20 to 30 percent higher for guys than we normally see. Um, it's going to seem weird, but it's just relative to the field this week. So. With that, uh, we will jump in. If you are new to Roto Pros and not, you know, haven't checked us out before, uh, I I would say definitely do it. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about us here. Um, we'll jump over to the website and have a look. Um, this is where you're going to find our article, uh, uh, Dane's article every single week. Our articles for all sports up here under articles. We also have uh, three different pricing plans: weekly, monthly, and yearly. Um, we give you free trials with those as well. And if you use promo code RP50 uh, with this video, you're going to get 50% off on your first payment uh, once that uh, trial time is up. We also have access to Slack. It gives you access to our cheat sheets, our one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, we got a lot to offer, so make sure to head over and check that out today. So jumping in here, Dane, we've got the Honda Classic. We've got PGA National. If you... Thought last week was chaos. Buckle up, everyone. Uh, I said that this morning. Um, this is a top five hardest course, three years running, uh, five of the last six years, and that includes major championships. So I guess right off the bat, let's talk about the course. On a tough, tough scoring course like this, what are like your two, three stats that you're really trying to narrow down here? Yeah, obviously ball striking um, and then scrambling around the green, whether that's – there's a few different stats you can look at. And I've, I'm have i going to ask you, that's one I always struggle with, which one to use, whether it's right. scrambling, bogey avoidance, or strokes gained around the green. Um, I'll let you touch on that in a minute. But mainly is, is ball striking. I mean, you got – the winners we've seen around this place are ball strikers. you got to be able to hit these greens and, and stay – um, again, it's another course with quite a bit of water. Um, we keep this Florida swing going, and it's kind of similar courses all down there. I mean, mm -hmm. um, there's forced carries over the water um, and things like that. So you got to be on your game or, or you can um, make a big score pretty quick. So those two things are pretty big. Um, and then I'm looking at some approach – it's kind of mid irons for mid to long irons, I think for me, or, or the approach um, proximities that I'm looking at this week. Nice. Yeah. Going back to that uh, around the green versus scrambling versus sand. What I do is generally just look at around the green. I feel it uh, gives a more, a more fair comparison between players. Sometimes with scrambling, um, I don't think it gives, you know, it doesn't paint the full picture of a player compare, you know, compare them, the same. So generally what I do is if there's a course with a lot of sand, I'll just do a uh, stroke scan around the green. If I'm looking at that and I, this week I've got it about 5%, 10% actually, I believe in my uh, custom model. And then if there's a lot of sand, I'll add like a 5%, you know, bump to sand, but generally I'm not running the scrambling stat. I'm, I'm really heavy on these strokes gain stats uh, in my model. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. Okay. And then when it comes to ball striking this week, it's one thing I noticed when doing my research, uh, going back and looking at, um, I'm just going to jump over here to the sheet. There we go. So for the player stats, we look at, I talked about last week, how we only had about three players inside the top 20, top 25 that were um, averaging over 300 yards. This is a little bit different here. In the top 25 here, we're almost seeing almost over the last two, three years, almost 50% of the players inside the top 25 are averaging over 300. So it looks like they can get a little bit more distance here, which seems weird because there is water in play on 15 holes. So um, I don't know if that's maybe an outlier. I'd like to dig in a little bit more, but that's one thing that really stood out to me right away. But generally I think a lot of guys will be, you know, laying back a bit and it all depends on the holes because some of these par fives are pretty beefy, like hole number six. I'm going to jump back to the course. Um, I've kind of got it 
up here, it gives you a really good view of kind of what the course looks like on this picture that I'm showing here. There's about four or five holes pictured here and there's just water everywhere. So there's danger lurking everywhere. So it's a lot like last week. The fairways are small like last week. Um, the one difference here is the greens are a little bit bigger. So with my strokes gained approach, which I'm leaning about, I'd say between approach and off the tee, I am about 70% approach, 30% off the tee. So really heavy on approach here. Uh, it, it comes out in the correlation stats when looking at the strokes gain correlation to finishing position and to DraftKings scoring over the last couple of years as well. Um, but proximity is going to be big because the, the greens are a little bit bigger than average this week. Um, so I'm going to be looking at the proximity stats. And then again, like we always say with proximity, when you're working with either like proximity stats and looking for those distances, or you're working with like, say, par four, par five, par three scoring and looking at the different distances, it really comes down to what players you're targeting. So generally, if you're targeting a player that's longer, you're going to be looking at proximity distance. This is kind of in that 125 to 150, 150 to 175. And then um, for the shorter hitters, if you're targeting someone like that, you're going to be looking at the longer area or longer ranges, like 175 to 200 and 200 plus. So I don't generally put that in my model. Um, but once I start breaking it down, each player individual a little bit more, I start looking at the distances dependent on that player's own skill set. So that's one thing I try and stress every week um, when it comes down to nailing down those distances. So it's going to be a tough course. If we go and look at uh, the past winners here, I'll just bring up the course history here real quick. Uh, Sung JM last year, minus six. Keith Mitchell, 2019, minus nine. 2018 was Justin Thomas, minus eight, minus 12 from Ricky Fowler. We'll be talking about him here in a little bit as well. Maybe a little bit outright betting outside the 50 to one area. Adam Scott in 2016, oh. uh, minus nine. So we're pretty much seeing uh, pretty consistently a winning score like between minus seven and minus 10. So that's kind of why we see a top five hardest courses on tour here. So um, I guess, first of all, jumping back to the sheet here in the top tier, we've got Sung Jay right at the top, I believe. Yeah. Berger is second, but he is first in the odds uh, outright odds to win this week. So we've got five players uh, with Westwood in there, Neiman and Adam Scott, who are all above 10 K on DraftKings. Grouping those five guys together, these are all guys that we've kind of been on um, recently, um, but not at these prices. So out of these five, who is your favorite? Uh, do you have one over the other? How are you kind of deciding between these guys if you're going this route this week? Well, I mean, first of all, you shouldn't even ask me that question because you know my answer um, probably. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so so Neiman, Neiman's my favorite. Ten four is crazy, honestly, but yep. um, I think this is a spot he could break through and win. Um, he, again, he's the ball striker. He does worry me a little bit around the green and things like that, um, just being able to get up and down. But, hey, he played pretty well last week at, at a tough course. Um, overall, his, his putting was actually decent last week. Um, so if he puts everything together, I think this is a spot he could – um, pick up a win. Um, other than that, up top, I think I do lean Berger over Sung Jay for me. Um, just kind of like his form over, overall over the last year. I, I was a little worried about uh, Sung Jay coming into last week just with kind of the ball striking. Honestly, he'd lost three in a row. He'd lost strokes on approach. Um, he had been getting it done off the tee and he kept that going last week. He was about flat on approach, but that putter has been like hot fire since January. I'm not sure what the deal is because I've not been used to, to seeing that out of Sung Jay. Maybe no. that's just an area he's greatly improved, but I mean, that's six, six tournaments since January that he's gained at worst 2.8 uh, strokes putting, and he's got a couple seven stroke weeks in there. So he's fine. Obviously I think I just, I just lean burger um, at the very top. Uh, Westwood, that that's insane to me. I can't believe it. Um, he's in awesome form. Um, got good course history here, though. So, I mean, I could see him picking up some ownership. I don't know. He's definitely not my favorite, but he's fine as well. Scott would definitely be last um, for me just because of his uh, recent form. I'm not too high on him. So, if I had to rank him, it'd go Neiman, Berger, and then M and, and Lee Westwood are very close as number three for me. I'm I'm pretty close there with you. I got Berger first, um, and then M, and then Neiman, or actually Eamon, then Nim, I guess. 
um, Westwood than Scott. Yeah, the Westwood thing's crazy, and that you mentioned ownership, so that's one thing I wanted to touch on here. I was going to go into it before and kind of do a preview last week, but Dane, last week sucked. Um, I, I had a terrible hey, we week. We had myself. a one and done winner. That's right. That's what. That's another reason. I I had my note pop up here and say that we had our one and done. But yeah, I wanted to hit on last week a little bit. Um, the cores didn't really work out for me whatsoever. My one and done personally didn't, but our our one and done with Thomas worked good. So that, but that's not what I wanted to touch on. One thing I added to the sheet this week was a review um, of last week. So what it's just pretty much looking at everyone that was in the field, their GPP ownership. As you can see here, it, it was absolute chaos. Um, in the top 10 of ownership, we had six guys that missed the cut. We had the winner, obviously, but we only had two top 25s and six guys missed the cut. Um, this kind of leads me into ownership. And one, I'm just going to go to sort by salary here real quick. Pop this down. Just because I wanted to look at some, talk about some strategy stuff here before we go in. I know we talked about the top tier here, but I kind of want to talk about how we can at attack this top tier, especially when doing like 20 max. That's what I've been doing every week um, is the 20 max. And I've been kind of looking for that contrarian route. So as you can see here, we talked about um, last week being, you know, with Finau, Cantley, Hovland, Mark Howell, right in there, that that was kind of going to be the chalk. Well, that's kind of where the chalk went. We could have pivoted to Hovland. Out of all those guys, he was around 16%. Didn't matter, he missed the cut. But still, um, that's that was one spot we did talk about that was probably going to be the lowest owned of that group. But that pretty much that whole entire group missed the cut, which was absolutely insane here. Um, but right above them was Bryson at 13%, finished third in 100 plus DK points. Thomas was only 17%, which compared to those guys below him, um, and we know why. I mean, he, he'd been struggling. Um, he'd been very up and down recently, but he won. Um, another one that stood out, I mean, Rory was lower owned and he had awesome course history there. So this top tier was much lower owned. Rom would have been a great play at 10-9, even at 14%. He hit 80 points. So I guess my point here is I like to look at ownership. So if Lee, Lee Westwood was the one that really stands out to me this week, that it's going to come down to Wednesday and kind of going to depend where he falls in terms of ownership projections across the multiple sites that we look at. We look at Fantasy National. We look at Fanshare Sports. We look at, I think you look at GUP as well um, for ownership projections. And we kind of mash those together. If Westwood looks like he's going to be possibly one of the highest owned, obviously he's back-to-back runner-up finishes. And now he comes back to a course where he's had awesome course history, including a T4 last year. If he's going to be high owned, I think we can pivot off of him. Um, and I think Neiman, honestly, people look a lot at course history. Uh, course history and form are not near as good as Westwood right now in terms of like recent, recent form. So I think we can get Neiman at maybe, I don't want to say half the ownership, but it feels like we're going to see Westwood in the, my projection is kind of going to be, let's say, 22, 23%, kind of like where we saw Webb and stuff last week. So 20 to 23, let's say, 20 to 25. Top three, top five highest owned guys. And I think Neiman's going to fall outside that maybe in the 16 to 18% range. So I, there, there's a nice pivot there. And I think, um, you know, I, I don't see Westwood's run. He jumped from, like, what was his price last week? 7,200, 7,300, like a $3,000 jump. So I, it kind of feels like he's at his top here. And this is the and if he's going to be high owned and kind of at his top performance peaking, that's kind of the spots I really like pivoting yourself. What do you think? Yeah, he was 72 last week. <laughs> uh, I, I really do like a pivot off of him. I mean, it just feels like if he's going to be popular for sure. Yeah. Um, I won't be on him. Um, it just feels like a, a letdown spot. I mean, that sounds like a, a dumb way to think about it, I guess, but Two second places and big events the last couple of weeks. Now he's priced up. He's got a WGC. He'll, I'm assuming he's playing in next week. I mean, that's yep. four weeks in a row for. Um, I mean, he's an older guy. It's not he's an old taking man. anything he away from it. him. He's in great shape. I mean, um, but obviously, uh, but I, I just don't. I can't see him paying off a 10-6 price tag. But no. Um, I know it's kind of you got to look at it relative to the field, I guess. But and his form is is probably better than anybody in the field. But it just feels like a letdown spot to me, and especially if he's going to be popular, I'll be getting off of him. Yeah, that's kind of the way I I feel about that situation, and that's kind of the way I've been going about um, making my pivots each and every week is just kind of narrowing it down. Like last week, 
we talked about like if you're using an optimizer, you could X out those top guys and then just kind of roll a balanced lineup. Obviously, that would have crashed and burned real hard if you wouldn't have picked the right ones. And I don't think you know many did because obviously the ownership was all over twenty percent there. But you just picking, you don't have to pivot everyone in your lineup. You you can like literally find two or three guys that are priced in the twenty percent owned area and maybe just fade the top three in ownership. Fade the top four. And for me, I'd like to do that a lot more on these volatile scoring courses, hard, tough scoring, where someone's going to, you know, back-to-back balls in the water. There's going to be miscuts from big names like we saw last week. We're going to see Chalk absolutely miss the cut and crush people's dreams. That always happens on these tough courses. Over and over and over again, we see this. So a good strategy isn't maybe finding a price range to go and X out, but finding ownership projections. Find... Even if you mix in three or four different sites, find guys that are like top five ownership, X those guys out of your, you know, even if you only do that in 10 of your 20, if you're playing 20 max or if you're doing 150 and you maybe X those guys out in half of them or something like that, make your build that way. And that's a great way to really take advantage of the volatility. There's a lot of volatility in golf to start with, but there's a lot more volatility at courses like this. Um, so this is a place I'll really take advantage of that. So make again, make sure to join us on the Wednesday show. We're going to be talking ownership, looking at this a lot closer. It's early in the week. Our, it's only really guesses right now where the ownership's going to fall. But later in the week, this is going to be huge. So make sure to join us on that live show on Wednesday. Uh, moving on here, um, you know, we looked at those 10K guys. The 9K, not really doing much for me. But if if we kind of go down here, let's just group this 8 and 9K group together. Is there anyone that really stands out? Because mine are ugly, and you know, you said it was going to make you puke, or you were going to make me puke last week with some of your picks. I'm going to do that in the 8K range for you, but I'm going to let you go first here, so you don't choke on your puke. Oh, I can already tell. I know <laughs> you're going to make me puke here in a minute, but I do have a few guys in this range that I actually really like. And first, it's Shane Lowry, 9200. Um, he looked really good last week, finishing eighth, kind of put everything together uh, there at the players. He had been struggling a little bit. Um, I like that coming around. I think he's a, a local guy when he's in the States um, to this course, uh, 21st here last year. Um, so I'll be on him for sure. Um, 8,500, Matt Wallace. He's a guy that grinds out these courses. Um, and a couple weeks ago, he was 18th at the Arnold Palmer. Did he not play last week? I don't think so. No, I didn't see him uh, in the field here. I will go over to the oh, last wow. week review. Unless he was like a late entry or something, because I don't always get uh, those. I'm not no, he didn't. It in Fantasy National, but I thought he I thought he played for some reason. But he gained strokes everywhere in his game at the yeah. Arnold Palmer. Um, so I like that. He's a, he's a grinder. Um, can definitely get it done here. So Matt Wallace, he's got a 20th place here a couple of years ago. I like him. And then lastly, a guy that I think is going to be super low on um, at 8,200, Dylan Fratelli. Um, he looked good last week. It was kind of weird. It, it, he was not good off the tee, but on approach, four, and a, four strokes on approach um, and six around the greens in route to a 22nd after coming off three missed cuts. Um, and still didn't put the putter together and finish, got a 22nd. So I think he uh, can get it done here, 11th here in 2018. Um, Sean Flash, at least, that he's played well around here. So I think he's going to be a low on guy that, that I can go to at, at 8,200. How about you? I love that call right there. That's That's the call that you give me every single week that I haven't even looked at. I looked at the whole entire field seven times today, you know, updating things. He's the one player I didn't even think about. You put me on a player like that every week, and it's been successful. Everybody write that down. Dylan Fratelli is going to be probably, I know, I bet he's like 10% or even like 7 to 10% owned when these other guys are going to be high owned. All right. Are you sitting down? (laughs) I got (laughs) three ugly ones for you. Okay. First of all, Ricky, I'm not. Okay. I'm not on Ricky Fowler. I just. (laughs) He's too expensive, obviously. I do like betting him. I got him. Uh, I see 46 to 1 here. I, I get him at 55 to 1. So I had to put a little bit on that just because we kind of said a, few, a while back. I know we kind of ditched it. But <clears throat> for for that number here, 
he's won here. He's got a lot of good finishes here and even came into some of those with some bad form, um, checking that out. So I'm going to bet him outright, or it, I don't think the top 10 number is going to be any good, but I will bet it at 55 just because it is a higher number than I've found anywhere else or a better number than I've found anywhere else. That's number one. That's not DFS play. Uh, he's too expensive for me for losing three strokes on approach, like three straight weeks and the putter has been awful. Like, no, there's nothing good besides <laughs> his around the green and his scrambling has been really good. That is like seriously all that's been good going for Ricky right now. Um, but, you know, that number, I'll take it on him. DFS, though, this one's kind of ugly, too. But when it comes to we talk ball striking, you said ball striking. You said ball. I heard you. You said ball striking is very important here. Keegan Bradley, Dane. Keegan Bradley, I'm going full Keegan this week. Um, he's number one on my sheet in ball striking, number three in approach. He is, like, in terms of long iron on the sheet here, he's 26th from 150, or 150 to 175, 175 to 200, he's eighth, and 12th from 200 plus. He's fifth in par five scoring, so he may, he'll get his strokes on those two par fives. So I'm not worried there. The par four scoring, 71st there. He's like middle of the pack. So that's kind of scary. The putter's always scary. Um, he's not that great scrambling. 43rd and birdie or better percentage. It's It just, for me, it comes down to he's been playing good. He's got, he's had flashes here, of course, history. It was kind of a long time ago, 14, 13, and 12. But the ball striking is what gets me, um, kind of sets me off here. Like T29 last week, he gained 2.2 strokes on approach. He's gained strokes on approach, I believe, in nine or ten of his last eleven events, and he's he's gained strokes putting in two straight. So the putter's been decent, but he can easily lose seven strokes. It's going to be a GPP only. Um, just at eighty four hundred, just seems a little expensive. But that's one guy I'm looking at, and it's just strictly off of ball strike, and that's what really stood out. And then Brendan Steele. I'm really curious just to see. I just wanted to bring him up. I don't know what I'm doing with him yet. Uh, the, the course history obviously is amazing. T4 last year, missed the cut 19, but three straight top 15 finishes in 15, 16, and 17. Um, what I, what also stood out to me was, hey, he's uh, you know he's made, what, now seven straight cuts with a, a T4 in there, a T18. The rest are like T30s, T40s. So I was like, okay, well, he's got decent form. He's making cuts. He's got good course history. He could pop and go off this week. But then I dug into his fantasy national, just like the strokes gain over the last few events. It's ugly. Uh, just losing, like, lost 3.9 strokes at the players, lost 3.3 at Genesis, lost 2.1 at the AT&T uh, Pebble Beach. He's just very up and down, so he's another guy that's going to come down to ownership. If he's going to get ownership because of that decent form plus pretty good um, course history, he's another guy I'm going to fade. And, you know, I'll go to a guy like maybe Cam Davis, whose form over the last two events is pretty terrible. He's missed two straight cuts. But before that, he had some really good form, and he had a T8 here last year as well. So if the if the, that's just one we're going to have to watch to see how the chips fall. But those two guys I'm definitely tracking. And then I want to ask you what you think of Doug Gim. Um, he kind of had a, I guess, kind of a letdown final round last week. He's missed the cut here last year. Do you think people are going to be off of him now? Do you think they're jumping off now that they see him not finish last week because they're getting excited about that? Plus the really, you know, the bad course history, one one year sample size. I don't, I think he'll be I don't know if I would say popular, but I don't think he's going to be super low on just because of where he was popping um, up on the leaderboard last week and his yeah. strokes game number for the week looked pretty good. So um, 8,800 is getting up there, but um, again, it's the field in general. And I think he'll be, he'll be owned, not one of the highest on, not one of the lowest on. He'll be in that mid range. So if you like him, play him. If, it's that's he's one of those I don't think it'll be I'm worried about ownership with him come Wednesday night right on and then just kind of moving down um another guy that stands out to me and then I'll let you touch on a couple of value guys to kind of tie into that stars and scrub build that we're kind of feeling right now uh James Hahn really stood out to me and an event like this I'm just going to jump back to the sheet here Make sure we got there. Okay, so for Han, the the price at I can't spell his name. My bad. And now I'm messing up the sheet. 
7,300, 8,700 on FanDuel, 7,300 on DraftKings. Um, he played here, I think it was back, missed the cut in 14 and 13. I mean, that's a long time ago. It's the ball striking that's, again, standing out to me. Not so much, it's more the approach than the off the tee as well. Um, last three of or last four events, he's gained 3.9 strokes on approach, 5.3. He lost negative 2.9 when he missed the cut at Pebble, but then he was T10 at uh, Phoenix, um, gained four strokes on approach there. He's gained strokes putting in all four of those, which I like. So that always steers me, you know, towards someone that's kind of hot with the putter, very consistent with the putter. I like for cash games just generally because you know it's not going to be a roller coaster ride on like Keegan Bradley, where you know he's. He's maybe got that top 10 upside uh, with what I talked about with his ball striking, but he can easily just miss the cut by seven strokes with his putter. So um, James Hahn's one that definitely stands out to me. He's been consistent making the cut and flashed upside. So that 7,300 price tag on DraftKings just really stands out to me. Yeah, I like that too. I like his ball striking uh, numbers. Um, and like you said, I don't know if if 2014 and 13 or anything to worry about where – lot more into the current form um i feel or at least i am um yeah. compared to course history especially when it's that many years ago so yeah he's he's a nice value play um a couple guys i like in here one of them i'll save to the end because he he's gonna turn around and make you puke so <laughs> um, but kh lee 7500 he's been playing pretty well seventh and 38 here the last two years um played very well t to green um at the players around the green was a little rough, lost four strokes around the green. Um, that part of his game is usually not that bad, though. So um, he was 41st last week, but he gained four and a half off the tee, two on approach. Um, so I like that, and I like his matching that up with his course history. Um, Pat and Kazire uh, does not have very good history here. Um, but is playing pretty well. Gained four on approach last week. Um, gained on approach the last three times out. Um, so I think he's a fine play. And then the one that'll make you puke is Phil Mickelson. So, <laughs> oh boy, seventy four hundred. Um, and kind of where I'm. I like the way he played last week. That was I was pretty impressed with Phil. T to green. Um, gained one off the tee. Gained four and a half on approach. Um, which coming off of what he had been doing was was a nice turnaround. And his around the green game was flat to losing a little bit to the field, which is definitely not usual for him, but um, regardless of how he's playing tee to green. So I like to see that. Um, and 7,400 is a guy that we know he'll go make five birdies in a row and then he'll make a couple doubles. But that's what we want for for DraftKings scoring. We want guys that'll that'll do that, and sh if their one under is much better than a guy who makes um, a bunch of pars and a birdie. So, um, Phil is um, is fine for me. I don't know what people will do with him. I don't think he'll get super popular just because how he'd been playing before then. But I like what I saw from him last week, so I'll, I'll definitely go there. No, that I wouldn't say that makes me uh, puke. He's you know he. Been doing pretty good, you know, looked pretty good on the, the Champions Tour, dialed in with the irons. And like you said, just with 7,400, he's too cheap for a guy that can put together strings of birdies like that. If he, you know, pre-cut makes, let's say, you know, eight, nine birdies, um, makes the cut, gets into the weekend, you know, totals like 12, 13 birdies overall, he's going to be like his pricing is inside the top 40. So he's 37th in pricing on DraftKings. 39th on FanDuel I think he can easily get inside like he's got that uh, floor of probably if you know making the cut um, and then somewhere I'd say top 30 in DraftKings scoring so for for that price I'm definitely on board if he was in the 8k even the high 7k range would be a different story and again he's going to be a guy we're going to have to monitor because I'm not sure what people will do with him at this down here uh, what was his I'll just slide back to last week here and see what his I think he was like 7k 7k and he was less than one percent owned uh t35 last week and put up 71 dk points so over 10x he just absolutely crushed that 7k price it only went up 400 so you're even you know another performance of a t35 like last week and it's going to be it's going to be harder scoring for sure so let's just say a t35 is going to get you maybe 60 65 dk points i think that's 
that's great value, great points per dollar value. So I'm with you there. I, uh, um, that's another guy I'm going to add to my list. I was kind of wanting to hear what you had to say about him first. So it, uh, I'm definitely going to be on board with lefty there. So not really looked into too many of these other guys down here. Um, one that I guess you could go with if you're really going with, uh, stars and scrubs build would be Bo Hogue. He missed the cut here last year, missed the cut in 2012. It's more the form. Like he's been a top 25, top 30 machine. Um, this season you know, outside the missed cuts and at that it's more of a price tag thing getting that little bit of uh, consistency that he's had this year Jason Duffner you could think about a little bit he's another guy that uh, you know he'll plot around and he's done very well here top 30s in four of his last six events here and he's made the cut in eight of ten um, so don't mind that either um, for low plays but uh, one thing I wanted to look at it's going to make a little bit of a difference here in terms of some Thrive Fantasy plays that I'm going to look at this week. We're going to talk about the weather. So I just want to go look at the early forecast in the week and give you kind of a sense of what we're going to be looking at. So what we see here, uh, wind. It's going to make it tougher. We haven't seen it. You know, last week we were fairly lucky, like with scoring. But as you can see here, Thursday, we've got 15 to 18 mile an hour winds with gusts of 20 plus. Friday, much of the same, maybe a little bit less overall, 10 to 14 mile an hour winds, but gusts of 15 to 20. Saturday looks like, you know, calm in the morning and those same winds pick up in the afternoon. I can't see Sunday here yet because we're only at Monday right now, but it looks like we're going to be very windy. So I guess we're going to have to look at some guys that kind of play good in the wind. Um, we're going to throw some of that in the chat this week. I'm going to dig into um, some strokes gain total, strokes gain T to green stats. Um, in the wind from fantasy national kind of dig in and you know compare to what i got in my model for t to green guys and kind of go that route but what that kind of you know for my decisions in terms of thrive fantasy which is just round one i just want to look at we'll slide over to this tab so sung jm sitting at an over under of 69 and a half strokes so par 70 on this course so they're pretty much saying is he going to par or worse or shoot under par here right now i've got it uh over myself for round one with the wind it's kind of that's the wind is going to be i'm not finalizing my picks until wednesday night let's put it that way daniel berger is sitting at three and a half birdies over under uh the over is 80 points the under is 120 um i might take that under if it looks like it's going to be really windy round one but generally with daniel berger taking the weather out of effect i like the over for 80 points which is the favorite here and then Shane Lowry, um, I don't know what to do here. You were talking about him a little bit earlier. His over-under on round one is two and a half bogeys. If it's going to be that windy, uh, I just I almost have to take the value here with, uh, with the bogeys, which gives you 110 points. But three bogeys doesn't seem like it'll be hard to make around this <laughs> course yeah. with 15 to 20 mile an hour wind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good, good. We're on the same page there. And then, um, so those are the kind of ones I'm looking at. Again, don't make these decisions, especially when there's going to be weather until Wednesday night. Definitely join us for that show because we are going to dig into the weather quite a bit um, on Wednesday night and give you our final ownership projections and stuff like that. But uh, is there anyone early in the week? You, you I'm going to give the, all the props to you last week on one and done. Um, Justin Thomas is kind of the way you wanted to go. He said he could rebound, could be low owned. What was his ownership? Did you end up seeing that in that contest? I did not. Um, I don't even know if there's a way that I can go look at that. So <laughs> I, I do know that he was low owned in the, uh, geez, what the carbon contest once not low yeah. owned, but he was outside the top five. So that was a, that was a good win that boosted us up the board. Is there anyone you're kind of looking at early in the week here? Um, I think you still got to go near the top. Um, I don't think there's anybody down the board that I would be comfortable using. Um, and some of these guys up top are going to have the opportunity to, um, take one in a much weaker field. Um, I think we've already used Neiman, right? Yes, we did. It was crushing. Oh, God. Uh, we used Berger on the win. Um, uh, probably Lowry, honestly, is where I, like I would that. go. Um, I, I do. I don't know if he'll be popular or not. Um, 
I don't. What about you? I've not really thought about it to be honest. No, I. I didn't even talk about it when we were talking our top tier plays because we went to 10k and below. But I'm I'm leaning. Lowry's one that stands out to me a little bit. He's on my list. My final three. Uh, I was also looking at Burger on my own. I don't think I've used Burger yet. He was another one, and then the other one was Taylor Gooch. We didn't talk about him at all. T thirty eight here last year. T twenty in 2019. Coming off a of T five, he was pretty spectacular, gaining six point eight strokes on approach and four putting last week. He also gained 3.6 strokes around the green. I believe he was fourth best tee to green last week. Um, that was awesome. The week before wasn't as great. He lost strokes ball striking, T, but still finished T43 at the Arnold Palmer. Uh, the week before, he had gained strokes everywhere, T to green. So that was awesome to see. Um, so with the course history, with his form at 9,300 going on the DK side of things, I really like that if you're going balanced. He's probably one of my favorite plays right now and he's the other uh, he would be the third guy on my radar right now for one and done so it's either going to be gooch lowry or burger for me for one and done this week yeah so it actually says we've not used neiman um so i guess my top two would be neiman and and lowry i just like dfs so awesome um, that's where i'm at right now right on any final thoughts here before we take off and uh I'm going to go start building some lineups tonight, a few anyway, and on some guys before I forget uh, that you give me the winner in Fratelli. Probably going to have to go bet him out right now just to make sure. Yeah, I think there's a few bets um, I do kind of want to make. Um, I don't I don't love some of the odds on guys, no. um, but at the top, just like I was just talking about, Neiman and Lowry, um, I got Neiman. Um, I've not pulled the trigger yet, but he's 20 to 1. I know that's a very short number, but – um, I feel like I, I still – I want to be there for his win. So, I think he could get it done this week. 20 to 1 is, is fine. Um, and then Lowry's 29 to 1. I'll, I'll be in on that. And then the two guys, I mentioned them um, in that 8K range, 66 to 1, Matt Wallace and 70 for Telly. So, um, I'll get on those both with the top five um, bet tacked on to both of those. You get for Telly at 70 to 1? Yeah. Geez, I should be sending you some money over. I'm only seeing fifty to one. I, I, the state. Come I was the state. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I was gonna jump on at fifty to one. I went on Taylor Gooch was my first one, thirty five to one. Um, I haven't. You know, this is a tough week because yeah. all the numbers are just pushed up because there is no. You know, we don't have like Rory and Deschambeau at the top, even two elite players that have you know eight to 12 to one odds really push these guys down like we would normally see neiman he's 20 to one on the sheet here that we're looking at but uh, normally we'd see him probably around 30 30 40 to one somewhere in there um so it's just a tough week so i'm probably going to go a little bit lighter on my outrights at the top uh gooch was one that i really like uh neiman the number's still a little bit high for me i'm only seeing 19 to one on mine but gooch was one um Ricky Fowler, I said, I just got to put it on there. I'm going to put five bucks on Ricky Fowler at 55 to one. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Um, but I like the Matt Wallace number, like you said, and then I might just dig in and, and hammer a few of these outrights kind of in that mid, that 50 to 100 range. But uh, I'm going to be looking probably at some top 20s instead, target some of these low number top 20s and try and jump on that. But a little bit lower on the on the betting side of things here for me this week. Yeah, same. Um I think I might back off some of um, – I usually risk – I don't know if – this is just the way that I've started doing it. I make it where um, everybody wins the same, which is probably not the way to do it with these longer guys. Um, right. Because you would obviously maybe like to win more with them. But uh, I've just started making them where everybody wins the exact same amount. It's so, like 1000 bucks. Um, put whatever I'm on the guy. again, I might make it – do what? Like you're gonna like just to clarify, so you're 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 betting whatever it takes for that guy to win a thousand bucks or this guy whatever it takes. So what right. you're betting on each guy is a little bit different, but the the outcome will be the same. Uh, will be right. the same outcome if either of them wins. Right. I like yeah, that. and I might if I do that again this week, I'll probably cut that in half. Um, yeah. Instead of to win a thousand, do to win um, five hundred. Um, just because I don't, like you said, uh, anybody can take it this week. So, um, 
I don't feel as confident in going hard on some of these guys. So I might back that off a little bit. Right on. Well, that uh, kind of wraps up the show for this week. Um, again, I want to remind you guys that March Madness is coming up. Dane has been covering college basketball and crushing it this season. He has a betting sheet for college basketball posted in chat. He's going to be updating throughout the tournament, um, which starts on Friday, I believe, Dane. Friday and Saturday are the first round. They moved it up from Thursday and Friday this year. So it's, yeah. it's going to be exciting times. A lot of college basketball content coming in. We're even thinking about maybe doing a show. Not 100% on that yet, but we're going to try and put something together for content. If not, we've got a lot of stuff going on in Slack. So if you're not a Rotor Pros member, make sure to get over to rotorpros.com. Hit that yellow sign up button. Get your free or get your free trial today and use promo code RP50 to get 50% off after that trial is up. Thanks a lot for joining us, everyone. Dane, thanks for joining me again. And uh, let's go make some green screens. Good luck out there, everyone. Let's do it. Good luck.